Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be video number four in a series on getting started in existential psychology. In the last video, let's see what we did in the last video. In the last video, we took a look at the question of whether existentialism is necessarily atheistic, whether it's necessarily individualistic, and whether it's necessarily dark and gloomy. And the answers to all those questions were yes and no type answers. Okay, so that's more or less a way of summarizing what we got done in the last video. In this video, uh, I want to start something a little bit different because in the previous three videos in this series, we've been unpacking what I think of as a common everyday way of understanding existentialism and noticing ways in which it's correct and noticing other ways in which it's not correct. We've more or less run to the end of that arc. So in this video, what I'd like to do is take up uh, two or three, depends on whether we need to make another video or not, issues that are uh, perhaps items of concern uh, for you students and you beginning students of existential psychology. But before we launch into that, uh, let's put on the hat of the day. My hair's a little bit wet today because I just got out of the shower not too long ago. So to keep the crazy professor hair under control once again, another wonderful sartorial statement in the form of a hat, a chapeau, if you will. Okay, so, um, all right, so first of those two or three issues, depending upon how quickly things go, isn't existentialism a distinctly European phenomenon and a distinctly European way of seeing life, existence, being? So uh, the other side of that question would be, if it is a distinctly European phenomenon, then why should we here in the United States or perhaps in the Western Hemisphere more generally care about it. Perhaps if it is just a European phenomenon, it doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of relevance for here where we live. Okay, so um, is it a distinctly European phenomenon? Once again, yes and no. You're probably getting sick of hearing that, but <laughs> that's the deal in this first arc. Okay, so um, all right, so existentialism is an instance of what is sometimes known as continental philosophy. The continent in question is the continent of Europe. And usually when people speak of continental philosophy, what they do not mean to include is the kinds of thinking that come from the British Isles and places like that. For the most part, continental thinking is centered in probably two countries more than any others, and the two countries would be France and Germany, although they're existential thinkers from other countries too, but uh, I would say probably two-thirds of them <laughs> come from either France or Germany. So uh, that is uh, weight on the side of the scale that says, well, yeah, it definitely is a European phenomenon. Moreover, um, some of the more famous manifestations of existential psychology, such as Binswanger and Boss's Dasein's analysis, which is a form of psychoanalysis that derives from Heidegger's work, as you might well infer at this point in the semester, that comes from Europe too. <laughs> All right, and there's precious little weight on the American side of the scale. We do have Rollo May, whose book will be talking about either one or two videos from now. Uh, we have his former protege, Kirk Schneider, who's still alive and on the scene and still doing existential psychology. Um, and those are American counterexamples, but still for the most part, almost all of these thinkers come from Europe and <laughs> even more specifically, most of them come from France or Germany. Okay, so. What about weight on the other side of the scale? Like, how is it not a distinctly or perhaps exclusively European phenomenon? Okay, so here the deal is, and I'm gonna quote a little bit from uh, Rollo May's book, Psychology and the Human Dilemma. So in chapter eight of that book, which is not the book you'll be reading in this class, it's a different book by Rollo May. So uh, in chapter eight, he, he describes how uh, Existentialism is, in a way, a very American way of thinking. It's a very naturally American way of thinking about life, you know? Um, and the reason why is because uh, 
from a general uh, existential point of view, uh, what life is about is uh, sort of the immediacy of decision and action that we take in our lives, uh, the immediacy of experience over and above the search for perhaps esoteric uh, abstract truths or something like that. There's a, a recurrent emphasis on sort of the, the here and now of life and that sort of thing. There's a recurrent emphasis on freedom and responsibility within existential thinking, which seems very sympathetic with a typical American way of seeing things, or at least what we like to think of as a typical American way of seeing things, whether that's uh, really made manifest in the reality that we live out. You can always debate that, you know, because a lot of the time, you know, what we uh, proclaim as our values is what we're really struggling to attain in life like this is something you learn in psychology probably relatively early that a lot of the time when people are are really you know bellowing very loudly about their values and what's right and so on what they're really saying is this is what I'm struggling with this is what I've not yet attained in my life and that's why I need to to bellow it out and make it sound loud and all of that kind of stuff but at any rate we at least claim to value freedom and responsibility, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Isn't that what our some of our fundamental founding documents say life is about? Life, liberty, okay, not necessarily exactly the same as freedom, but definitely something related to freedom and the pursuit of happiness. So uh, the weight on the other side of the scale, the, the other side of the scale would say, well, it's not really just a European phenomenon, would uh, be that, well, you know, existentialism seems like a very natural American type philosophy insofar as we are philosophical <laughs> and that's uh, that itself is a whole other ball of wax you know like why are so few philosophers <laughs> Americans is a is another interesting question you know whether philosophical and activity comports easily with our cultural sensibilities and values and all of that kind of stuff is is a, <laughs> a whole other question all right, so, however, again, getting back to the Rollo May book, however, despite these natural affinities between existentialism and an American uh, traditional cultural mindset, there are significant antagonisms, okay? So the question is, well, you know, the obvious question is that, well, you know, if there are these sort of natural affinities between these two things, if it seems like existentialism, at least in part, would be a very natural American mode of philosophy, then why isn't it more prevalent here in the United States, for instance? Okay, so um, the answer to that is that uh, part of the antagonism has to do with uh, our emphasis on practical results and especially practical results that translate into things like making money in the marketplace. Okay, so this is another element of our uh, typically American mindset, that we love things uh, that have immediate practical value, and usually that means uh, immediate financial value too. And uh, Rollo May's analysis, it's pretty interesting. Let's see, did I mention this? No, I guess I did not mention this in your notes, but um, his analysis is that this, this comes out of uh, the whole frontier ethic which uh, had, went on for probably a, a century, I would say, at any rate. And, um, you know, in the, in the frontier, when you're trying to tame a 3,000-mile-wide continent, uh, boy, you know, with 19th century technology, you need to be practical in a hurry or you die in a hurry, okay? So if you're out, if you're moving, pushing west and all that kind of thing, and, and if what you're doing does not immediately translate to very practical, concrete advantage, odds are you're not gonna live very long. So uh, for him, he sort of roots our emphasis on the practical in, in that historical period that we, we went through, or our forebearers went through. Um, or, you know, some, some of our relatives, like some of my relatives, came from Germany, Germany in the uh, late 19th century. So not necessarily all of your relatives went through this, you know. But um, in any case, so uh, I guess, you know, maybe I'm a manifestation of continental thinking in some sense. Ooh, odd, odd sort of thing there. All right, so, all right, so... 
If you have a culture that is really centered on the practical and attaining practical, and usually that means financial type results, anything that does not easily fit into that pattern is going to be immediately suspect. And existentialism tends not to fall very easily into that pattern. Why? Because uh, existentialism is mostly about, well, existence, the way we characterized it in the very first video in this series. And, uh, you know, uh, coming to grips with what being actually is. And so there's this will to, to think things through in the most fundamental ways and the most fundamental stratum upon which human, human, our human lives are based is uh, the stratum of being itself. We are, after all, human beings. Okay, so uh, the whole sort of issue of being is woven into our self-definition at the root level. Human beings, okay? But uh, the thing about a very practical attitude toward life is it tends to place emphasis not on that, but on doing. The question is always, what are you doing? So if you're studying something like existentialism or existential psychology and you go home to your family, let's say at Thanksgiving or something like that, and they want to know uh, what you're learning and you say, well, I'm taking this one class and it has to do with all these kind of weird uh, European type thinkers and it's called existentialism and the basic focus is to try to reveal uh, the fundamental nature of existence or being and an obvious response to that might be well yeah what are you going to do with that like okay you've realized the nature of your existence now what are you going to do with it like how are you going to make a buck with that like how are you going to sell that in the marketplace how are you going to get a promotion because you know so much about existence and uh, that sequence of questions, I'm trying to make it sound a little bit silly. Hopefully I was successful because there is something a little bit silly about it. Um, and the silliness goes like this. Well, you know, you could live your whole life never thinking about your existence, never thinking about being, never thinking about life, and always worshiping at the temple of being as productive, as doing as much as you possibly can, like all the time, like get her done could be possibly the motto for your life. And that could very easily wind up looking like kind of like a robot, like a robotic kind of existence where you're constantly like just doing things without a whole lot of sort of reflective awareness of what makes the doing worthwhile in the first place, at least in any way other than a very trivialized way. So if you live a life where you're just getting tons and tons of stuff done, but there's no real connection to the reality of your existence, then the question is, yeah, what's the point of that? What's the point of that? Because that can be very empty and very shallow. And probably in our country, a lot of people, uh, you know, take up that paradigm for their lives. And then all of a sudden, you know, perhaps in middle age or even later, if they're lucky, they'll have this moment where they begin to question, like, what does it all add up to, really? Like, what does it really matter? Like, they have maybe a, a room full of trophies and promotions and plaudits that they've, they've gathered along the way. And all of a sudden, you know, the sort of terroristic existential question is like, yeah, you know, like, um, it doesn't really add up to much, maybe nothing, you know? <laughs> what really matters is life and the pulse of life and coming into an awareness of the pulse of life and in that awareness coming into a deeper kind of participation, you know, hearing the music and joining in the dance of life in the mad dervish dance, that maddening rhythm sounding in your bloodstream, in your heartbeat, in your breath moving in and out of your body, like all of that is underneath everything else. What really matters, like are you alive in any powerful and poetic sense? Like, are you alive? Like, what does that really feel like to you to be alive? Like, that's the kind of question that really matters. And doing has its place in this world. No one's denying that. But it doesn't make much sense if you're doing and what you're doing is not in the service of something greater than the doing itself. Like, if it's not in the service of something like you're really coming into life, if it's not in the service of carrying you beyond the outer perimeter of everything that's automatic and robotic about our lives, then what the hell's the damn point? Like at some point you can ask that, probably in middle age. It might be tough to ask that right now, let's say you're 20 years old. That may be a difficult question because you're probably worried about like just getting your hands and feet on the ladder and beginning to sort of climb up 
with respect to sort of the social hierarchies that are, that are laid out in front of you. And so this question may seem like, wow, that's a question on the distant horizon. Yeah, but here's the thing about that. Like if you don't start taking it seriously, even if you are 20 years old, probably where you're gonna end up as you climb up the ladder, you know, like a crazed monkey, you know, you get to this, this point and then you'll be like, so what? So what, I climbed up this ladder, so what, who cares? Like really, you know? So that's the kind of tension that, uh, you know, Rollo May is, is talking about and that I think is important to notice even at this relatively early juncture in the semester, you know, that because, because a course like this is going to be running against the grain of some of the prevailing currents in our world and the prevailing currents say you should put all of your time and all of your energy and all of your talent into getting stuff done. And what existentialism is saying is, yeah, there's a time and a place for that. But if it's not in the service of something deeper, it really doesn't mean much. And it won't mean much even for you as a person. Yeah, you know, if you're a good succeeder type person, you could end up in a comfortable position in your life. You could be well off and all of that and drive a nice car and so on and so forth. But so what? Who cares? You know? Is like the, the sort of value of your life in direct proportion to the kind of car you're driving? Or on the other hand, is you're driving your car in the service of something deeper, right? So existentialism says like it doesn't make sense if you're just like a success-driven robot collecting awards and promotions and raises and stuff like that if it's not in the service of something fundamental to what you are. And what is most fundamental of all is your existence itself. So, um, okay, so, uh, yeah, you know, if, if too much doing, not enough being. Okay, that would be one way of saying it. You know, like, part of what makes existentialism a difficult thing in American culture is we tend to make a fetish, you know, like a golden calf or something like that, out of doing and pragmatism at the expense of being. So we end up living these incredibly lopsided lives where we're trying to accomplish, you know, you can accomplish so much in your life that your soul just wants to scream. <laughs> and, you th and you may think like, wow, what a, what a weird thing to say. It's not weird. It's just that your culture makes it seem weird. Okay, you can be accomplishing so much and working so damn hard all the damn time and be a success so much that something inside of you is crying. Something inside of you is screaming, you know, because you're not being fed and nourished at the level of who and what you really are. So it's a cautionary note, even if you're 20 years old. Okay, so I wrote a little paragraph at the bottom about uh, how I personally take up this intersection between a largely European way of seeing things, existentialism, and our particular American perspective. And uh, the point I'd like to make is that I personally find that to be the most exciting locus for taking up existential thinking from an American point of view. So I'm not one to pretend like I'm sort of some kind of pseudo-European or something like that. You know, I wear like a baseball cap and not a black beret or something like that. And, uh, you know, so, and that's maybe emblematic of sort of how I proceed with things. So taking up the insights of continental philosophy, I find to be a tremendously exciting thing from an American point of view. And the reason why is this, that um, the strength of the European approach is its precision and the, the profundity of its insights into the nature of existence, okay? So that's the strength. The weakness of the European approach to continental philosophy, I'll even say it in a more general way than existentialism, continental philosophy in general, um, would be that it's prone to uh, the dynamics of 
something like intellectual celebrity, which from an American point of view is almost a contradiction. Like we don't think of intellectuals as celebrities. We think of as, uh, you know, like basketball players and, uh, you know, actors and, uh, you know, singers, entertainers basically is who our celebrities are. But in, in Europe, they have a, a somewhat different approach. It's possible for you to be an intellectual and to be a celebrity as a consequence of being an intellectual, all right, to be a famous, well-known celebrity. But um, part of the problem with that is that if you're really driven by the desire to be an intellectual celebrity, then it makes it much more likely that you're going to fall prey to a kind of obscuritanism in what you say and what you write and so on, to try to be as uh, inaccessible as po possible so that people will think like, wow, you must be really deep if I can't even begin to get you, you know? I think that this is less common among the existentialists than it is among the people who came after the existentialists, like the post-structuralist types, I think, fall prey to this dynamic uh, much more frequently than the existentialists do. Like uh, if you read Jacques Lacan or someone like that, or Derrida, uh, you know, their, their writings are, some, it's like reading hieroglyphics sometimes, you know, it's sort of like that level of inaccessibility. And I think that's coming out mostly out of this neurotic uh, will to be some kind of intellectual celebrity. Okay, so what about the American approach? Well, the American, the strength of the American approach is our, our desire to have things be more or less lucid and accessible to, you know, a large segment of the population. You know, maybe not to every single person, but at least to a fairly large segment of the population. Like the American thing, we have this sort of egalitarian sort of desire that, you know, like any sort of insight into life we, we feel like should be sort of... Um, accessible enough and lucid enough and uh, compactly phrased enough that you know most people can get on board with it and use it and work it in their lives and that sort of thing which to me is a a kind of strength the weakness of the american approach is our tendency to oversimplify things you know so the strength of the european approach is that they tend not to oversimplify things <laughs> you know um the strength of our or the weakness of our approach is that um, we do tend to oversimplify things. So, uh, but all in all, I would say that this intersection between uh, our American uh, attitudes, you know, and desire for things to be lucid, and so it, con combining that with the European strength, which is sort of the depth and and trenchancy of. <laughs> of their insights. Like to me, that's the most exciting locus. Yeah, let's take deep in insights and see if we can make them accessible to people's lives so we can benefit more than just, you know, the little tiny coterie of the Konyo Shenti there dwelling in the damn ivory tower somewhere. You know, it's like, yeah, well, why shouldn't every day, every day's people's lives benefit? This is part of why I'm making these YouTube videos for that matter. You know, it's like, uh, cause I believe in that project, you know, like, yeah, let's take some of these sort of difficult, sometimes abstruse type insights uh, from these European thinkers and try to popularize them in some way, hopefully without losing too much of the subtlety, but probably it's inevitable that some subtlety will be lost, but, and make them accessible so that, I don't know, to me that's, that, that's a uh, desirable thing, that more people would benefit as opposed to fewer people would benefit, I don't know. I, it's a crazy way I have of thinking, you know, that if you have something good, wouldn't you rather more people enjoy it rather than fewer people enjoy it. But then again, okay, I'm an American, so I have that point of view, right? Like, like the good is for more people to enjoy the fruits of something rather than for fewer people to enjoy the fruits of something. But there, there you go. There you go. You know, there's some of the tension right there. Okay, so I guess I'm not going to finish this segment in this video because I'm sort of getting the sense that this is went on longer than I thought. So we'll take up the next couple little threads to tie up at the end of this in the next video after this one. And I guess we'll just call it a day. Oh my goodness, the sun came out. It was storming earlier. The sun came out. So... At any rate, I hope you have a great day. Let's see, did my hair dry up after all that video? <laughs> Probably not because the hat was on it. This is a hat from my friend's farm. So, uh, Two Creeks Farm. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, have a great day. Bye-bye.